Good day from Banjo Dunk Production Studio in Toronto, Canada. An audiobook podcast based on my book, My Good Times with Stomp and Tom. I'm your host, Duncan Fremlin from the band Whiskey Jack. I must warn you, if you're looking to learn something, or if you think the stories we tell here will make you a better person, forget it. The next few minutes will be a waste of time. If, however, you want to have a few laughs and spend the rest of your day with a stupid grin on your face, well, you came to the right place. So, turn off the damn news, sit back and be a fly on the wall as we tell you things we once promised never to share in public. And one more thing. Turn up the volume. Chapter 1. Canada Day Up Canada Way To this day, I can close my eyes and immediately feel transported to a fairy tale kind of moment, like a three-dimensional memory. I'm not imagining it. I'm lounging in what appears to be a committee room in Canada's House of Commons. Walls covered with polished wood panels and garish chandeliers hanging from the 30-foot ceilings, the kind one might see in Buckingham Palace. It's called the Confederation Room. Decisions of national importance are made here. I'm sitting on a large chair that is equally as magnificent in its size and weight. My elbows are leaning on an enormous marble table. Next to me, at the head of the table, sits Stompin' Tom Connors. He's stage ready. Black hat perched on his head, black and white patterned shirt, black vest, black pants. In one hand is the necessary cigarette at the end of a holder, and in the other, the equally necessary moosehead beer. On the table in front of Tom, there's a hubcap-sized ashtray and a few bottles of beer. Besides his chair is a Coleman cooler full of beer, no ice. Tom likes it room temperature. On the other side of the table are some members of my band Whiskey Jack, Stomp and Tom's touring band. There's Bobby Niven, my guitarist for the many years we've been playing country music in Canada. Bob's nursing a beer and watching the goings-on with interest. Beside him is Conrad Kipping, our mandolin player. On my other side sits fiddle great and multiple Canadian champion Graham Townsend. As far as musicians go in Canada, Graham is like the Confederation Room, large in style and skill, but modest in stature. Others in the band, drummer Rob Duffus and bass player Greg Street, are wandering around Parliament Hill, checking out the other performers as they go through their sound checks. We can faintly hear the stage sounds when the door opens and closes. Someone is playing Le Canadien Errant, the wandering Canadian, on a piano. How appropriate. There's a restlessness in the air all of us anxiously preparing for the biggest night of our careers. Besides performing on the largest stage we've ever seen and in front of the biggest crowd of our lives, our audience will be pretty much the entire country. We're in Ottawa, our nation's capital, on Parliament Hill, and it's Canada Day, 1993. Tom's tour manager and longtime business partner, Brian Edwards from Rocklands Entertainment, told us earlier in the day that the audience in front of the stage would be 500,000, and the TV audience and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation was going to be more than 3 million. These are awe-inspiring numbers for this humble five-piece country band from Toronto. As I look over at Tom, he's looking pretty cool, at least from the waist up. His feet tell a different story. His legs are crossed, and one leg is nervously swinging back and forth, going to beat the band. A man walks into the room. It's CBC producer Peter Heyman. He and I had met before. He walks over and shakes my hand. I introduce him to Tom. Peter begins to tell Tom about the plans for the day. Someone will come and get the band, Peter says. They'll be taken to the stage so we can get sound levels on their instruments. Then someone else will come and get you, lead you to the stage, and we'll get your levels right and make sure you're comfortable before we move on to the next act. Don't feel you have to rush. 
Peter had a wireless device in his hand, and he placed it on the table. We're going to hook this up to your guitar so you won't have to deal with cables. Tom had never used a wireless before. Yet another out-of-his-comfort-zone moment to deal with. We'll attach this to your strap, and it'll be turned on before you walk on stage to sing your first song. You won't even know it's there. Peter's calm demeanor and detailed explanation seemed to settle Tom down a bit. He relaxed and smiled. We still had a few hours before we hit the stage. Lots of time to drink beer and smoke cigarettes and talk about nothing in particular. The anticipation is hanging over us like a heavy blanket. There's way too much time to worry and fret. What could possibly go wrong? Would Tom remember the lyrics? Would we know where to stand? Would our microphones work? Were we going to be able to hear ourselves in the monitors? Would I break a string? Was everything going to work properly? In our storied careers, Whiskey Jack, Graham, and Tom had performed live on TV and radio many times, so we all knew only too well the pitfalls we might encounter. In this case, we were particularly hopeful that Murphy's Law would take a vacation today. The night before, in my role as band leader, I was called to Tom's room for a meeting. That's when my personal stress level began to rise. We arrived at our accommodations earlier than that day, not exactly the level of comfort that I would have expected from a gig of this importance. To this day, the building is still standing and doing business on Carling Avenue. It's called Webb's Motel. The rooms in 1993 can best be described as clean. The Chateau Laurier, the hotel where the members of Parliament would stay, it was not. When we arrived, we all backed our cars up to the door of our rooms, a convenience I would have swapped for a more comfortable room in a better hotel. I knew in advance that this was never going to happen on a Stomp and Tom tour. Tom didn't like being exposed to strangers in the lobby for fear he'd be recognized and approached by a fan. He liked to control moments like this. He also liked to back his big Suburban up to his room. More on that later. Once we all got settled, Tom called me on the motel phone and asked me to bring everyone to his room. Brian, Tom's old friend from his early days in Timmins, Gate Lapine, were sitting there. Tom and Gate had guitars in their hands. In front of Gate on the table was his huge binder full of lyric sheets. They'd been playing tunes together. We're not going to play Bud the Spud, Tom started. They asked if I could sing the hockey song instead. I thought we should go over it a few times. Everything about this conversation was uncomfortable. Rehearsing was not Tom's thing. The preparation for our national tour consisted of a picking session one afternoon at Tom's house, a whole lot of beer, and buckets of Kentucky Fried Chicken. So the idea of rehearsing a song we had been singing for 25 years was somewhat unusual. His normal ease and playfulness were replaced with an out-of-character seriousness, an intensity that we would see only in the hours leading up to a big show. If there was any doubt this was not going to be a normal gig, that was over. The next day, when the call came to begin our sound check, everything moved at breakneck speed. Each band member had their own stage hand to organize their setup. With my banjo strapped on my back, I followed my techie to the stage. He was carrying my amp. One less thing for me to think about. I took a moment to look around at this amazing scene, people everywhere, all purposefully going about their important duties. Then, another pleasant surprise. Across the stage, standing in front of an electric keyboard, waving at me, was my old friend from my hometown of Sault Ste. Marie, Doug Wilde. Next to him was his bandmate from the group Manteca, Matt Zimbel. Matt, I found out later, was the music director that day. I was glued to my spot on the stage. This is where you'll be standing tonight, I was told as the stage crew slapped down some masking tape with banjo written on it. Doug walked over to say hi. No time for an extended visit. Maybe it was the familiarity of these encounters, but having Doug and Peter Heyman nearby relaxed me. These were top-notch professionals, and all would be good in Stompin' Tom land. Once we were set up, two producers walked on stage with Tom, guitar hanging over his shoulder. 
They had a microphone set up for his voice and a microphone for his stomping board. It took what seemed like a very long time to get the level right for his board. He was impressing upon the sound technician the importance of hearing his boot in the monitor. There were furtive glances between the technicians, both perplexed and amused by the uniqueness of this. They had never had to figure out the sound qualities of a piece of half-inch plywood before and were clearly enjoying the experience. The show itself was a bit of a blur. We were about to be introduced. My heart was pounding as I stood stage left, waiting for the cue. I saw Tom behind me. He had placed a little Canadian flag in his black hat. His eyes were like laser beams, but not looking at anything in particular. The concentration was intense. I was surrounded by my bandmates and Fiddler Graham Townsend. We were all poised and ready to run when cued. The entire show was produced to accommodate the TV audience. So when we were called to set up, which took seconds, I could see the gigantic TV screen behind the stage as it panned the crowd. It was an absolutely fantastic scene. Hundreds of thousands of flags waving, a sea of red and white. We hadn't even started to play, yet a half a million Canadians were yelling for Tom. Then suddenly, in French and English, the announcer says, Next up, someone we all know and love. His songs are snapshots of our lives. With his tribute to Canada Day, please welcome a proud Canadian, Stompin' Tom Connors. Tom began, It's Canada Day up Canada Way. The force of his performance was evident when he stepped to the mic, even before he sang a note. He got off on the wrong foot immediately and sang the second verse first. I'm sure his performance was colored by the pressure and excitement we'd been experiencing all day. It wasn't just Tom. We were all overcome with emotion. He continued to mix and match the lines of It's Canada Day as he sang. No big deal. Each line was patriotic and complete on its own. This was the perfect song to sing on this day. He wrote it for exactly this moment, and he made the most of it. Meanwhile, standing behind Tom on the back line was a smiling Whiskey Jack band. We were glancing at each other with a Can you believe this? look on our faces. Graham Townsend, looking stately in his white suit, was to my right sawing away on his fiddle, all business. As a mostly blind man, he was only focused on his fiddle. Everyone was playing brilliantly. The show was going exceedingly well, just as we all dreamed. When It's Canada Day ended, there was pandemonium. The Canadians on the hill were ecstatic. Flags and banners continued to move about. The cheers were deafening. I sometimes wonder if Tom had ever thought that a simple fellow from Skinner's Pond, PEI, could have owned a stage of this magnitude. And own it he did. This was his moment. He had the ear of the nation, of his beloved Canada. He couldn't have scripted this scene better if he had tried. Thank you so much, he began. This is my first time here, and if there's some of you here for the first time, I sure know how you feel. His voice cracked at this point, and he was overcome with emotion. It's great, he exclaimed as he pumped his fist. The crowd went nuts. Keep it Canadian, guys. We need you. I was going to do a different song here, and I'm going to surprise everybody. I was supposed to do a different song. We rehearsed it last night, the whole thing. I changed me mind. Something has happened in Canada on the 100th year of the Stanley Cup. That got another rise out of the crowd. They knew what was coming, and they approved. I want to dedicate this song to all those well-bred people from the Ottawa Valley. Another fist pump. As we were to learn months later, the Ottawa Valley reference was a story that would resonate throughout our tour. For now, the country was on the edge of their seats waiting for three words that in any other context would be mundane. Hello out there, Tom sang. Mundane, they were not. What followed was a five-minute snapshot of what it means to be a Canadian. From my perch on the stage behind Tom, I was a lifetime Canadian hockey player enjoying the scene as it played out in front of me. But it was much more than that. I was actually a part of the story. Nothing I had ever experienced before could have prepared me for this. There I was, a country hick from Bar River, Ontario, 
my banjo and my voice, being broadcast across the country in support of Mr. Canada's finest moment, singing, of all songs, the hockey song. It was my heritage moment. Under ideal circumstances, being a backup musician behind Tom was often a bit like riding a bucking bronco, trying to ride an untamed horse with no saddle. Tom's sense of timing was honed and fine-tuned on the stage at the Maple Leaf Hotel in Timmins 25 years earlier. The only metronome available at that time was his boot on a piece of plywood. I tried to stomp my foot through an entire song one time, like Tom did night after night, and I simply could not do it. Not only did my leg tire quickly and the bottom of my foot began to ache, but I couldn't stop in time. So when Tom began to sing on that Parliament Hill stage, the first few seconds were a frantic struggle on Whiskey Jack's part to figure out what his strumming hand was doing. Ideally, a singer who strums along with his guitar wants to have the two activities, singing and strumming, perfectly aligned. Not Tom. Most nights, there was us, the band, and there was his mouth, each apparently with a mind of their own. Sometimes they knew what each other was doing. Sometimes they didn't. At the beginning of the most important song in the most important show of his career, his hand and mouth were off and running in every direction, and frankly, we had no idea what to follow or pay attention to. As our fellow Canadians were jumping for joy, yelling their approval and singing along, we were casting glances at each other, straining to find a rhythm, a common beat that we could all enjoy together. At one point, there were seven musicians on stage, plus Tom's voice, all playing a different rhythm. It wasn't until we heard Tom sing, Someone Roars, Gretzky Scores, that we found our groove. It was good. As the first verse ended, we were strumming away, vamping on the C chord, waiting for Tom to continue with the song, when all of a sudden, the lights at stage right went up, and appearing from the shadows was a young man rolling out the Stanley Cup. Less than a month before, on June 9, 1993, the Montreal Canadiens had won this trophy. We learned later that the team delivered it to Parliament Hill earlier that day as a surprise for Tom. It remained parked next to Tom as he sang the rest of the song. As we all began to join Tom in singing the chorus, our national chant, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name, he walked over, raised the cup over his head, and shook it at the crowd. I remember feeling a bit queasy when I realized he was going to lift it over his head. All I could think of was the amount of beer he had consumed that day. How heavy was this trophy? Would he lose his balance? Thankfully, nothing disastrous happened. He finished the song, and we all hightailed it off the stage. Those five minutes represent the pinnacle of my years with Tom, no doubt about it. However, my friendship with Tom was full of peaks and valleys, a lot of great music and fantastic memories, some so outrageous they were barely believable, experiences that changed my life forever. It began when I was a young man.